And thanks so much for being here this morning. I know it's early, and um, so it's about 7, 7.15, and our eyes are waking up. Um, but this is really an exciting day for us here at Cardinal Stritch University and at our Eden Prairie campus and our Minnesota campus. And um, I've been Dean of the College of Business and Management and to my third academic year. And one of my goals and my visions that I wanted to do was exactly what we're doing here today. So I don't know if any of you have read the book, The Energy Bus, um, but it's a book about how do you gain your energy, how do you sustain your energy, what do you do to fuel it every day, and they talk about um, something that we know that typically, and I'm not a golfer, but I do know people who golf that, they talk about that one great shot, and that's what they remember and that's what they talk about. Well, for me today, this is my one great shot for the day that will just take me into the evening and we'll be doing the same thing in Rochester tomorrow with two other alums who will be talking about their journey of social entrepreneurship and starting um, a coffee brewing company, um, roasting narrow, um, narrow road coffee and their whole journey about how did they want to give back to the greater community and support missionaries around the world. And so their coffee business, 25% of the profits that they are generating, um, go back to helping communities around them. And so what's very exciting about our program today is we continue to want to bring together our alums, our students, um, and friends of the university to talk about our mission as a university and as a college of business and management. So our mission is very much rooted in transforming the lives of the students and our alumni who come into our events, but it's really about helping people to find their mission and their purpose, and then how do they ignite that into their work. So today we're going to be talking about parts of our mission as a college of business. We want to create adaptive business leaders, but then business leaders who also understand that while we cherish the free enterprise and want to make sure that we're generating sustainable profits for our organizations, that we also understand there's a connection back to the people that are working for us, the people living in our communities, the greater environment, and how do we start to balance that. Um, but more importantly, what we're finding, and if you've read Harvard Business Review and you're reading a lot of things, the number one strategy for businesses today to keep their competitive edge is to be adaptable and to be on the forefront of always changing and evolving and moving then into innovation that comes from that. That's the type of graduate that we have built at the Cardinal Street University we want to continue to do. And so this morning you'll have an opportunity to meet um, one of my colleagues and alums of the university, Suhail Bajan, and he'll join us um, as we continue to move forward in our conversation. But Suhail is one of those people who really represent the best of who we are as a university. Um, we went to college together in those early days, and um, I graduated a little bit sooner, so I'm a little older. Um, but what's great is, he and his wife are both two-time alumni of the university, very invested, and he's also a trustee. But he's also someone who really knows that as a business leader um, in his field, he has to continue to adapt. But who I really want to introduce at this point is Jim Wolfer, our guest speaker this morning. And Jim, I had the opportunity to meet him this fall at the cybersecurity conference, and we have been putting together a new MBA with a concentration in cybersecurity. And so part of my whole efforts have been to meet alumni who can help us to introduce. So I'd like to introduce you to Eileen Manning as I'm working through my introduction of Jim. So Eileen Manning is a graduate of Stritch, owns a group called the Event Group, who lo and behold puts on a conference every year called the Cybersecurity Summit. And that summit, um, she's introduced me the last two years and I've been able to network and meet people. So two other gentlemen in the room I've recruited to be on our faculty when we introduce our new MBA with cybersecurity, Mike Johnson with Bremer Bank, and then Dave Notch, and um, I'm just gonna freeze here for a second, but it's in Intensity, Intensity Analytics. Analytics. He's president of the company. Um, two people within the CISO field, if you will, in, in information security and working at different levels within that. But it's really through alums like Eileen who start to introduce us to wonderful people. And so she introduced me, unbeknown to Jim, at a cocktail party. Good to see you. And um, at that cocktail party at the summit, I started to talk with Jim. 
And what I was amazed with is Jim's story about how he came to be an entrepreneur, how he came to leadership. And um, my PhD and my background is in leadership studies. So I'm very interested in how people come to their leadership. And then um, more interesting even in entrepreneur. <coughs> but then um, I had the chance to listen to him the next morning um, at a presentation. And so if you've ever been in the audience, you start Googling people. So I looked at his background and then found out how much he really connects back to the larger community and his value structures and what he believed in really fit our mission as a college. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jim this morning to you. And as you know from um, what we've talked about, is he's CEO and owner of Atomic Data. And he's responsible for providing, providing the leadership necessary to position Atomic at the forefront of the industry. He began his company as a consumer product um, providing IT solutions applicable to the masses. Um, but as the data industry evolved, um, his clients outgrew that. And really what a good adaptable person realizes, and he did, was no two clients were the same, and so you couldn't provide the same types of solutions. That was one of those tipping points, I think, in your business. And it helped to create then a forward movement. And um, so as the company has evolved, um, and the cloud computing, um, the company has come into being in data center locations in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Eden, Edina, Minnesota, Mankato, um, Phoenix, Arizona, Atlanta, Georgia, Hong Kong, um, Madrid, Spin, uh, Spain, Spin, Spain. So anyways, um, he makes it his personal and company goal to help business owners take control of their IT infrastructures, data, and, and properly use it to achieve their goals. So join me in welcoming Jim this morning. And um, he's first going to talk with us about his journey to leadership and starting his company. He's going to transition it to something that we're all hearing about. <coughs> Why should we be concerned about cybersecurity? What's in it for us? And then Sue Hale's going to join us for a part of that conversation. All right. So, Jim. I'm going to sit, which probably is uh, anti to any communication degree uh, <laughs> professor who's here, but uh, it's early morning, so I figure you'll, you'll go with it a little bit better. Um, I don't really ever give any canned speeches. I actually speak a lot. Um, I'm 21 years sober uh, off drugs and alcohol, so that'll be woven in here a little bit. So if I go into my AA speech a little bit, I'll pull back quickly and get us back <laughs> As Peter said, I'll tell you a little bit about, he wanted me to talk a little bit about leadership and, and how I got here. I'm sort of a made entrepreneur uh, just by my pure upbringing and, and how my life went. Um, at 14, I had a great desire to get out of what I saw around me, which was very poor uh, rural uh, existence in Omaha, Nebraska. <clears throat> and so unbeknownst to my parents, I snuck out of the house every day, I started my own business, and I raised enough money so I could go to the private school, which was across the street from where all my brothers and sisters were going, which is sort of the poor public school, and you never left Omaha if you went there. And I knew I wanted to get out and uh, go somewhere else and uh, sort of expand my life. And uh, so that was the beginning of, of my life, and uh, as I look back, that is really uh, kind of where everything started for me. Um, that was a big step. My father was not happy with me, and then I found out a little later that he was pretty happy with me because uh, I just didn't know how to really express that. Um, he passed away about three months after that, and um, that started me on a whole other path that we'll, we'll touch on. Uh, but it's important when I when I talk to people about you know Atomic Data today is a twenty million dollar business that I started from scratch out of my basement. It's growing at 40 to 45 percent a year. We have data centers now at all those locations, plus in London and Toronto, since that was written. Um, we're a very nimble, fast, flexible company. Uh, we have clients like Best Buy. Target was in my office Friday. Uh, they asked for a meeting. We didn't go to them. Um, a lot of very large companies. Uh, I know that United Healthcare Group is here today. Medica is a, is a very large client of ours. and. Uh, uh, if you talk to their uh, CIO today, he'll tell you <clears throat> they love having a small, nimble company that can react for him because he can't build an IT infrastructure that can do that. So he's got to supplement that with some outside uh, vendors. So that's where I ended up. But getting there, I thought this was interesting because as I, as I prepared, uh, I bagged groceries, I painted houses, 
I was a dishwasher, I was a prep cook, I was a waiter, I was a line cook, I was a pasta maker. I uh, ran janitorial teams in the summer at a, at a college uh, when they used to have the uh, tile floors and you had to rip up the, the uh, wax every year and then re-wax, which I never quite understood, but we did it. Um, I sold Kirby vacuum cleaners door to door in rural Minnesota uh, one year, which uh, probably gave me my sales abilities. Um, I raised money for political parties from a call center in St. Cloud. I was a bartender, I was a bouncer, I was a nanny for two years for little boys. Uh, they gave me my rent and food while I went to college nearby. Um, I joined the National Guard, was our, an ROTC, was in the Army. I was a lieutenant uh, in a uh, mortar unit. I then became an underwriter and an actuary. I sold insurance to individuals and groups. And then by pure luck, the internet came along. <laughs> Uh, at that time, I started a, a little company called HR Simplified, which is about a $50 million business today, uh, of processing Cobra and other things online. Back in the day when we used to get all these faxes and it seemed like an idiotic thing, so we got paid $25 per Cobra that they put, on the, put, on, put online and submitted back in 94. Um, I put myself through that, that, that private high school. I put myself through uh, a private college, St. John's University up in Collegeville, Minnesota. Um, so really, if you look at my history, uh, I never really was happy with where I was, which maybe have some other things that I have to take a look at. But <laughs> I always wanted to keep moving. I don't, I don't know why. I think part of it was growing up. Uh, I had a father who was sort of a failed entrepreneur. Uh, everything he tried, he failed at. He bought uh, into Standard Oil at the wrong time and then sold it all. And then, it, of course, the oil industry took off. Um, he bought convenience stores before the 7-Elevens. Uh, he did everything absolutely wrong. And I think that that really gave me the best education I could have ever ever wanted was what not to do. You know, And he also was sort of all over the place. He never really picked a passion that he stayed with and ran with. And to me, if anybody, and I, I think uh, you know, this is for the very few, if anybody's looking at, at that entrepreneur uh, path, uh, you better really think about it, because I think it's the hardest thing you can do. And I think you have to be as committed to it as you are a marriage, or, and you can ask Eileen, um, you have to want to do that. Uh, there's a book out there, and I hate, I can't stand people that hand out uh, books for people like me or anybody else, because I think it's so customized that it would only really work for the person who wrote it. Anybody else who tries to do exactly that thing and not just take nuggets is kind of crazy. Um, it's called The E-Myth. And it basically, this guy studied 500 entrepreneurs and why they became entrepreneurs. Most of them became entrepreneurs because they got let go somewhere and they didn't want a loss. So they started something. Well, that's why 80% of small businesses fail in three years. You know, you've got to really want to do this. Uh, and therefore, I, you know, what I really found out is I had to get into something I was passionate about. I think it's why I jumped around so much and looked at everything. Uh, and then kind of once I found technology, I kind of was like, hmm, this is interesting. And uh, what I found interesting about it, and I was talking to Elizabeth earlier, uh, where is she? Is that uh, I'm not a tech guy. But I saw the need for what was coming in the early 90s. And uh, I decided I wanted to be the guy that was between all that. Because people weren't using it correctly. People weren't communicating it correctly. Um, and let's face it, to be a CEO today, uh, and be over 50 of a major corporation, you better have a lot of people that can translate and tell you and get you there. Because there's no way you're gonna get all the information you need uh, if you're at that age uh, and older. Because it's just all changing so fast. You need some young, dynamic men and women who are engineers, who are in marketing, who are in communications, that can disseminate all that information to you, boil it down and help you make decisions. Um, and I love that. That really turned me on. And so, uh, the big step I think for me after that, so I had a father that died, um, I kind of went out on my own, that was sort of in me, I was in the military, they used to do these tests on me where they'd blindfold me, drop me in the middle of a field and, and see if I found my way back or if, uh, and who took charge of the group and I always was the one that took charge and drove everybody 25 miles and got it back to where we were supposed to be. So, it was sort of inbred and it was, it was in my DNA so I can't necessarily say that I made a decision and walked that path, it was just there. 
So I had a little client, three guys in a closet uh, with some warm servers in 1993, 94, uh, called uh, Vizzy.com. They wanted to be an ISP. And uh, I sold them insurance. And uh, for some reason, I left a $200,000 salary uh, and took about 50 grand a year in some stock because they wore t-shirts and jeans and it seemed a little sexier and it seemed a little, a little more fun. And I kind of ran off on that path um, and it was a great path. Um, we ended up growing that business to about 10,000 business clients in the Twin Cities. They sold uh, against my wishes. I was the one descending vote out of, out of 10. Uh, in about nine months, the stock market crashed and all the stock that they had sold their company for was worthless. So the first, the first sale of Vizzy, a very successful company here in town, uh, I think maybe they got one or two million dollars for about a $40 million business, which is kind of sad. But learned another great lesson for me on what not to do. Um, when you take outside money, everything changes. And I learned that. It was a very important lesson for me. Um, I sort of cut my teeth there. I learned about infrastructure. I learned about uh, you know servers and pipes and the internet. And uh, I wanted to go learn about software. I knew nothing about software. Uh, it was stuff that went on servers as far as I was concerned back in those days. So Vance Opperman and I got to know each other. He had just sold Westlaw and he liked me. Uh, and so uh, he put me in charge of is.com, which is about 100 developers. Uh, some of them worked at Digital River. Um, and we did a lot of placement uh, of software developers. We did a lot of building <coughs> software. And so uh, I kind of learned my software. And I, I learned uh, that aspect of software development and the software teams, even though it was much different back then than it is today. Um, there was no iterative software development back then. You, you did very long builds for a year or two at a time, and it never ended up being exactly what you wanted. And then you started all over again. Um, so that's really where the background came from. Um, I ended up having to lay 300 people off of that company one day. And it was at that time when I decided, I got enough money in the bank, I had my e moment, and I said I'm not gonna work for anybody anymore. Uh, so I started out on my own. I got an office and a desk and a phone, and I sat there for three months and figured out what I wanted to do. Um, the bubble had just burst, it was 2000, 2001. Uh, things were really kind of going down and I thought great time to really build a company in the internet business and um, I decided that computers were getting smaller more things were going to go out uh, once everybody got over the fact that the dot-com uh, was just another phase and we would get past it and uh, decided to start a data center based business that was going to help people put data out there uh, in what we now call the cloud uh, and got there very early and started offering services to folks um, so Atomic has grown. Uh, it's pretty successful to this to this point. I get called practically every day from investors wanting to put money into the company. Um, I've learned my lesson, so I know what will happen when I do that. Uh, so we continue to kind of move forward. As I said, we have clients that serve uh, IDQ, Great Clips, Medica, uh, Target, Best Buy, Boeing, Ericsson, Sony, Aon Global. That's why I'm in China and in Madrid. Uh, we'll get to that as we get a little bit more to the security aspect of, of, of what we're going to talk about because early on we saw companies starting to put their data in the places they needed it to be and they didn't want it to traverse everywhere. So some companies saw that for very early on. Um, we'll get a little farther there, I guess. Um, Peter wanted me to talk a little bit about, I guess, some of the lessons I've learned because it's been a, you know, it's been a long you know, 13 years, um, 07, 08 were great years for us. Um, we positioned ourselves, we had no debt, and as people had to tighten up, we were there ready to help them take on a monthly expense rather than a capital expense. So we saw 45% growth during the 07, 08, 09 years, which uh, we sort of built this recession-proof model that really uh, helps business when, 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 they, when they're in need. Um, the other thing that we did, and, and I, you know, I do it probably because I like to do it, not because I think it makes good business sense. We had a lot of businesses that were hurting, and so we had to cut them a lot of slack. Uh, we had to cut the bills in half, but I didn't want them to cut their services in half. And a lot of people wanted to shrink. So a lot of folks, we just said, you know, for a year, we're gonna, this is what we're going to do. And uh, we didn't lose any business during, uh, from 07 to 09. I, I have less than a half a percent of attrition 
uh, a year of any of the business that go with us now. Some of that is some of that is is really the new model of cloud services. It's pretty hard to leave once you're in. I really gotta I gotta hit you hard to really make you want to leave. Um, now there are companies that are gonna hit people hard uh, and they're gonna leave, but uh, the whole nature of that is that they're they're a little bit more touched. So. Part of the adaptiveness, I think, and the flexibility of things is that you've got to pay attention to, the, to, to what's happening with your clients. I don't even understand people who don't. I don't understand strict business models. I don't understand when the investors ask me, oh, all these people who want to put money in, what's your model, what's your exit strategy, what's the 12, 24, 36 month plan? Um, to me, some of that's fairly idiotic. It's what money wants to hear. It's not what my clients want to hear. Uh, what my clients want to hear is, how am I going to save the money? What's the latest technology? Um, I heard a long time ago that clients didn't like contracts. That sounds pretty silly. I listen. We now don't have contracts. I have month-to-month -month contracts for all my clients. If you don't like the service, you can leave. Period. End of story. Unless I have to like dredge, you know, dredge fiber, and there's a certain cost that has to be spread over. Pipes are really the only thing that make you spend that money, but. So I think being adaptive means listening to your clients. Period, simple, that's what you have to do. If you're in a corporation, you gotta listen to your internal clients. Uh, a lot of us don't do that, especially in IT. A lot of us like to tell them where the boundaries are and stop and don't cross that line and I'm not gonna do anything else. Uh, we were talking a little earlier about that. If IT listens and becomes an advocate, they can probably manipulate the situation even more and control what happens versus going against everything all the time, which is I think what a lot of us, we know that sort of the old IT department is sort of that do it my way or no, we can't do that. Um, so I think that adaptiveness that a business owner or somebody needs uh, is the same uh, of a manager or an employee in a company. Listening is the skill that, that not many of us have really. Truly listening to what that person has to say, what their needs are, I think is probably the number one uh, characteristic that one needs in everything that all of us do, but I know I have to have. I now have to listen to my 120 employees, I have to listen to my vendors, I have to listen to Microsoft for the things that they really are trying to say, not what they're saying to me, because they're going to control some of my destiny with what they do with licensing, what they do with different things. I have to listen to uh, Excel Energy because my data center costs are enormous, and if I don't really pay attention, really pay attention to what they really mean, I'm gonna end up kind of sideways. I have to listen to everybody. I have to listen to my wife for sure. Uh, <laughs> but I think that this is this this idea of communication um, is we've only scratched the surface because we all listen with our past or we listen with the with the filters that we have and we hear what we want to hear. Now I've never heard a salesperson leave a, a, a sit or a prospecting meeting and not think they're gonna get the deal. They want and believe they're gonna get the deal and that's a nice characteristic for most of them. But they usually don't really truly read the room and really know what's going on. Really listen to the client and say, wow, that's a bad client for us, we should walk away. Uh, not many, because they listen with the filter they have and what they want. And um, I think that's probably, that, that is the most important thing. Uh, we were also talking a little earlier about you know th uh, three-year plans and, and things like that. Uh, to me, a 12-month plan right now better be written in pencil and I better have my racers out, and I better be re really ready to change um, all the time. Uh, I think 10 years ago, people thought I was crazy because I changed all the time. And now they're like, wow, you know, how does he keep up? Um, I move everybody, probably in, my, in, my, in the office setting, everyone moves every six months. No one gets to stay in the same seat, no one gets to stay in the same queue, no one stays, I stay in my office. Uh, no one <laughs> I find that very interesting, especially with IT and engineers. People like to feel like it's theirs. And, and I love that feeling. I want them to feel like the company's theirs. I don't want them to feel like that department's theirs or those servers are there or this application's there. So we change a lot. God bless my people. A lot of them have really put up with a lot of stuff. But they're now realizing that with the world changing as fast as it is, Maybe I kind of built some some skills in them that they didn't they didn't have. I also have a lot of guys. It's amazing how many engineers have have mild Aspergers uh, or or some sort of mild. But I actually have four highly compensated gentlemen uh, who are diagnosed and have have some form of, of autism or Aspergers, and they're brilliant. 
Uh, and they really get flustered when I move them every six months. It's like they have to reset for a month. Um, and I'm like, think about what that does to your perception of the client or the client's platform or the client's network. You know, a client came to me yesterday and told me that they were going to move a piece of business away from us to California, and they kind of explained their reasons, and I went, that makes perfect sense. I think that's a good idea. And I told the engineers, and they were devastated. You know, they're moving my network to where, and what are they doing, and how are they going to do this? And it was like, guys, this is, we serve our client every day, and it's their network, it's their data. So, probably getting a little lost there. Um, how are we doing on time? I think we're doing good. Okay. The other thing that came out of really, I didn't hit much, and I'm glad I didn't. Uh, many years back, I, I realized that problems with drugs and alcohol. A SWAT team helped me with that decision. And um, <laughs> those are for another story. And um, you know, with 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 with, with sort of that A type personality, I, I realized that that was that was a little dangerous mix. So uh, I stopped I stopped doing those things. And um, on my path. I really met a lot of very interesting, strange, nutty people. And um, it's helped me sort of see the world a little differently. Uh, I was a, you know, a white kid from, from rural Nebraska uh, until I got to St. John's, which really wasn't the bastion of diversity. I didn't meet that many different people. Uh, but boy, when I, got, when I cleaned up in Minneapolis, uh, it, was, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, and I have friends that have been mine now for 22 years that are all over the country uh, from that world. And they helped me see a lot of different so when we kind of got going, um, I really decided it was, and, and this was before the social movement of corporate responsibility, we decided we were going to give 15% of the bottom line uh, away every year, no matter what. Uh, and this is what we didn't have a lot, and we still didn't. Uh, now we have a lot. We, we, we you know, our, our core sponsor of a company here in town called LifeWorks uh, that puts mentally and physically challenged uh, people back to work, and they help them with rides, they help them with a lot of things. We employ a few of their, their members that uh, help take care of our facilities and filing and do a lot of things that they can they can accomplish and feel great about. Um, there's a company called American Refugee Committee. Um, this one was a little bit marketing and a little bit maybe a nice, uh, but uh, they have uh, 2,700 people around the world in the worst situations you could possibly imagine managing uh, refugee uh, camps, Haiti. Pakistan after an earthquake. Uh, they're in Syria right now. They're in uh, every Afri African country. Um, and we, of course, help them with their satellite uplinks. We do, you know, so there's a little bit of marketing here for me. I like the group. It's messy and they need to have data everywhere. And it needs to be secure because there are rebel groups trying to find out what they're doing and they're doing water drops or food drops for the UN. So we give them, and we're, we're their major corporate sponsor, and we, we help them a lot. Uh, we donate probably about 1,000 iPads a year to different camps, and, and we're, we're rolling out a couple of um, uh, websites for them that are gonna be uh, to train women to uh, do different jobs uh, in Uganda and in Sudan. Uh, I've been to most of those countries and, and interacted with those folks, and it's unbelievable. And I think that that has propelled us as a company forward uh, in many ways. I know that I have folks that would go looking. I mean, today you guys know if you're in IT, you're on LinkedIn, uh, you can get a job anywhere, uh, especially if you can curve that, that, that resume a little bit. Um, I think there's a one, there's half a percent unemployment rate in Minneapolis for IT professionals right now. Uh, so I know my people are getting calls all day long. I gotta give them more of a reason to wanna be around. Uh, they're always at these functions, they're all, involved in these these things. And a lot of them come to me and say, wow, you guys give it like, you know, half a million or a million dollars away every year. That's something. And we usually give it in the employees' names and we usually really try to incorporate them into what's going on. And I know that sounds good and it's a good marketing twist and I'm a, I'm a owner of a business and I'm, I'm gonna use it. But uh, we do it because it's the right thing to do. We think it's a better way to bring a community about. And um, you know, if that ties also into you know providing data all over the world and it meets our, our, our other things, well, it's good for us. I mean, it was a good choice and we paired it up well. But um, you know, when you have a woman win an award that you sponsored who travels from Darfur here, and we get to help build an educational intranet for her for all the women in these camps, <coughs> that's a pretty good day. I think I think we live with that. So if we can get marketing out of that, it's a great thing taught me a lot, and I didn't know why it taught me these things. But as I've now evolved uh, in, in, in IT, 
it's amazing that it kind of gave me a whole different vernacular that we don't talk about, which is the transfer of risk, which really now is 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 wiped. We're gonna we're gonna talk about for another couple minutes and then get into our cybersecurity uh, discussions. But that transfer of risk had just been staying in my mind for many years. You know, a lot of clients would have we'd have a contract, and if our services weren't good, we'd give them some money back. And, uh, that's kind of how things went for a while, and I think that's how most vendors go for a while. You know, uh, you limit your liability for what the client spends with you per month, and you, off you go, and you you, you kind of walk the path. You hear about big companies that have really messy uh, installs, or and I just heard one uh, company in town bought three million dollars of hardware, put it in a data center, and a construction guy drilled a hole in the wall, and tons of dust and everything flew in, <laughs> and they ruined the three million dollars of the hardware. And uh, they had to box it all up and ship it away, but nobody went to the insurance. The company got them $3 million. You know, a hardware vendor got them three more million dollars of the stuff. The construction guy forked in some money and everything kind of went away. <laughs> but the transfer of risk that's happening now uh, is immense. And we're not talking about it that much. Um, in the old days, and I'm, believe it or not, this runs up until today. In, in P, they call it PNC insurance in property and casualty insurance, uh, you buy a, P, a server, you put it in your data, you put it in your warm closet, you put data on it. It's covered under your property and casualty insurance. You give them the invoice; they know how much it is. If you're really good, you maybe have a cyber policy. If you're really good, you maybe have business interruption insurance. Not many people, less than five percent of businesses, buy business interruption insurance. Okay, well, that's sort of where the world stops. They all are staying still with property and casualty insurance. There's no such thing as cloud insurance. There's a couple companies now trying to sell it. It's kind of kind of a little, little out there. There's no law around it. There's no, I haven't seen a policy yet that actually isn't just a PC insurance kind of re rewritten a little bit. Um, but now if you take that data, you put it on my servers in the cloud in a data center, we really don't have coverage for it. There's a big gap. I have I have coverage for my gear if it breaks down, and it's very expensive stuff. It's you know football fields long and data centers full of sands and servers, uh, and your data's on it. But my insurance company doesn't know how much your data's worth. Doesn't really understand what that is. Doesn't understand that there's an expiration date on that data. That that data's worth something today. It might not be worth very much tomorrow. <coughs> and your PNC insurance would go, hmm, you didn't send me, you know, the address of that data center. You didn't tell me what servers you put in that data center. You don't have any data in that data center. Half of you probably, if you're using some sort of cloud, don't even know where that data center is. Don't have a physical address for it. Can't touch it. Can't go see it. Can't find the server that it's on. You're at Amazon. You're at Rackspace. You're at Google. Your stuff doesn't have an address. It's cut up a million pieces over a million things. So we really have a changing environment that's happening right now. There's no law on it. Um, the insurance companies aren't in a rush. They'll be in a rush to, to not cover you on something right now. I know that. Uh, I filled out a couple, and, and I should have brought it with you. I have five years of traveler's cyber insurance application. Five years ago, it was two pages. Today, it's 25 pages. And it kind of progresses, but they still haven't gotten there yet. And it still really doesn't cover anything. They want to know if you have some compliance. But I haven't found one insurance provider yet who asks about the data center you're in, the provider you're with, whether they're a SOC 3 or a, or, or, or a SAS uh, model. Nothing. No one, they have no idea about this. Uh, I still have not met an underwriter, and I've met with every insurance company in town that even knows what I'm talking about. So we really are at a changing place. It's hard for uh, a C-level to, to even understand the insurance risk. It's hard for us to figure out what we're covering. So with that, you really get the cybersecurity and how are we going to manage this risk. Um, you're seeing a lot of companies put things out, but I'm also starting to see the big companies pull it back in. You know, we're starting to see why, why are you going to go out here? We'll build our own cloud. And, and the larger companies, the larger IT companies, uh, or larger companies with IT, are starting to now almost build it as their own cloud service to the business. 
those are the smart ones, the ones that are really starting to say, you know what, we've got to get with this. We've got to get ahead of this. Um, it's probably the only way a company truly, in today's world, is going to cover their risk with insurance is actually to provide their own. Uh, but really, it's the smaller guys who are really caught in the crossfire. The big guys are starting to figure it out quickly and, and move to that. But um, there's a big hole here. Um, I was very excited when Peter told me that they were uh, going to expand and offer a new degree in cybersecurity. Uh, I think that, uh, ask me how easy it is to hire someone in this field right now, and it's nearly impossible. Especially if you get, you'll get a Cisco guy who's interested in being in security. I think that's probably the best you could do. Uh, most of the people that are really knee deep in it uh, are with uh, a firm uh, and growing. A lot of them are with security firms, which is where they should be. It's where they're going to learn the fastest. So they want to be out on the forefront, really touching a lot. So it's very difficult for a corporation and even a provider like me to find those quality people. So I'm thrilled that, that, that this degree is starting to be offered, and I'm very excited about it. Great. I probably ran over. Nope. So let's we're, 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 we're doing just great on time. Okay. So. Thanks, Jeff, for sure. telling your story and sharing the truth. As we transition, I'm going to call Suhail Su up. And what's really exciting about, I guess, um, as we continue to look at the changing landscape of business and the directions that we're going to go in, um, it's really exciting when you start to meet people in the business world that have this global viewpoint of, of how do we create business today? How do we um, understand the greater um, environment that we're working in? And how do we balance the people that we're investing in? So you heard that part of the story from Jim. But then also the communities that surround your businesses. And then how do we care for our clients, um, for uh, the people that use our services? And why is that important and listening? And, and so those are really great skills that you talked about. Suhail Badran, um, is with Digital River World Payments, and he's a Senior Vice President and General Manager of Digital River, leading all aspects of the company's global payment strategies, including strategic development, sales, marketing, product management, operations, mergers, and acquisitions. Wow. Um, another moment. Yeah, but he joined Digital River with an extensive experience in high technology organizations, leading sales and marketing, product management, strategic development, et cetera. And so, Sue Hale brings to this table again a passion around doing business and a commitment to that, but also is very much engaged in the community around Milwaukee and in the Twin Cities about how do they continue to build um, organizations that are not only just thriving, but also giving back and making stronger communities. So this whole question that we're going to talk about this morning about cybersecurity is really probably on the top of our mind. There's a number of things that have just happened. So you know today, Target Corporation's on Capitol Hill. They're going to be talking about the security breaches. And then also I was um, listening to the news this morning as I was getting dressed and you're not supposed to answer your phone um, and there all of a sudden there's people from foreign countries calling and just leaving just one ring and then people are actually dialing back and then they get charged ten dollars for it and so we have all of these types of activities that are happening that are really in the end cyber threats and security so my question to both of you is for someone who's not in IT and typically in the IT world like cyber security and, and infrastructure security is all really the IT people but now we're seeing that it's really not just contained to them so what should we know about um, as a dean of the college or a business owner um, or a manager, what should we know about um, uh, information security and cyber security? And why should we it matter to us? Take away. I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's funny. I think back about three or four years when uh, you know, the BYOD, bring your own device conversation came up and IT recoiled uh, ferociously uh, to sea level when this started happening. I think the iPhone and the Android were our biggest foes because they sort of brought every user into this sort of usable space of the data. Um, there's a reason they recoiled because they were like, my stuff's going to go everywhere, um, and now we're seeing it. There was a, I mean, they were they were right um, in many ways. Unfortunately, 
marketing one and Apple, those evil people, I uh, got this iPhone and iPad everywhere and now everybody does their business on it. Um, every manager, I mean, we, we put everybody through uh, HIPAA compliance training, uh, PCI training, um, PHI training, all these are, are, are to me, it's, it's, some of it's a little too mild. You watch a video for an hour and you're PHI compliant and you get a little check and we come back in a year. Um, every manager needs to be thinking about this. Every employee handbook should be rewritten that hasn't been rewritten in the last couple months for HR uh, that deals with this. It's everywhere. <coughs> every manager is an IT manager. I don't care what department you're in. Um, and that's how a company needs to start looking at it. It's a lot easier for an IT focused company that's touching lots of very sensitive data for me to overreact, I need to. But I look at it and it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, we've, had, we've had probably almost every e-commerce platform that we host, and we have a very secure, private environment. Many of them have, have been breached over the last 10 years uh, because of you know, SQL injections or things that you can't possibly you know, prevent against if you don't control the application, the hosting layer, every layer. So marketing needs to be just as engaged when they go out and, and put a site at a uh, at a vendor, just as much as IT has to be engaged. And I think we were talking about that earlier. That's a whole new premise coming for managers to have to look at that. And uh, people like many in the room and us, you know, we've lived there for a long time and saw it coming. It's very difficult to get the sea level ready to spend the money we need to spend on this. I think budget's probably the biggest obstacle. I don't think it's knowledge. I think it's budget and money. Suhail, from your side of the business and you're dealing with C-level um, people in business decision, decisions and e-commerce, what are you finding? I think uh, I'm just going to reflect back on the early days of the internet, this thing called the internet, which was supposed to be big, right? Uh, back in 96, 97, I was, I was working for a company. We started uh, around internet banking. And I remember going to talk to C-level executives at banks, uh, Reverend was not one. And they would say, why on earth would I let my consumers and my business users go online? And what is this internet thing? So I remember kind of this progression of 1996 talking about this thing called the internet. 1997 talking about, by the way, we're going to post it for you. And 97, 98 was all about, well, buying into it, but what about security? Then you had to talk about the back end, the front end, you know, integration tests, all of this stuff. Fast forward to today. And you know, I think it's the responsibility of all of us. I don't think it should be just a manager. I think there should be corporate rules, regulations, uh, people signing off with blood saying that yes, I will not use the word password for my password, which really is not our solution. Um, I was talking to Jim earlier. I said, in our world, and I'll explain just a little bit about the Jura River, Maslow's hierarchy where air is, you know, you can't survive without it. Security is there for us. We process every day. Uh, over a million online transactions, online payments. We process about $30 billion every single year just on the street in the Jew River. And our transactions are coming from all over the world. 50% uh, from here, 50 from, or 40 from Asia or EMEA, 10% out of Asia Pacific. So part of that security is also knowing what's good and what's bad. You, you cannot, you're gonna have very negative user experience if you uh, decline somebody when they have the right to be uh, entering your systems and uh, conducting transactions. So our process is along the lines of uh, know who you pick up the phone from, right? Understand where that email is coming from. We work very closely with our corporate IT and corporate security guys uh, to make sure that that attachment does not get to anyone's uh, USB drive or the, the uh, laptop. Few weeks ago, there was a penetration that happened to an internet-connected printer, not a power switch that was in the news. So, it's not a matter of just my PC or I picked up a thumb drive and oh, by the way, I left my uh, laptop at a hotel and somebody was able to plug in a, a little virus and it's just all around us and uh, everyone's got to be aware. And that education has to happen, kind of inside out and outside in, from the corporate aspect and then from government, banks, and everyone else. So if we look at, um, and we take the, the target corporation and uh, the... Uh, uh, poor target. Poor target. And, uh, the, uh, if you look at the, the whole idea of the cyber threats, and so when it comes down to protecting our businesses and doing business, what should we um, be aware of around cybersecurity and doing business in our global technology? 
technology in the advanced world. Because you can't just <coughs> stop doing business. So how do we frame this so that it's we're taking the appropriate amount of risk but yet being able to do business? Um, so just by a little background, I also spent seven years at a company called Verisign. Um, also you may be familiar with the rule lock and uh, we, uh, we actually used to hire Russian-speaking people, uh, people that spoke uh, in many of the Asian languages where we see the threats coming from. Jim would appreciate this. We have a security operations center that when a threat or a virus would uh, uh, we start to see an attack, we'll, we'll see these red kind of arrows coming into the US. I'm not going to ever used to see the traffic because we ran everything related to .com and .net, so we knew where traffic was coming from. And I think the, the biggest factor is um, it's a race. It really is a race. I don't think you can ever sit down. It's what keeps me up at night. Again, we are hosting millions of data, millions of transactions. Your credit cards, I may have them down the street. If you guys want them, let me know. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it's my, not just fiduciary responsibility, it's ethically my responsibility to try and protect it. So we keep an eye, and look, it doesn't matter how many certifications you go through it. It's almost your business plan comment, right? You have to put it in pencil. You're only as ready as the moment you sign off on it, and then you've got to start all over again. So it's diligence. It really is monitoring what's coming in, what's coming out, where your data is sitting in the trust. Is it, is it encrypted? Uh, is the data coming from a website or a point of sale encrypted as well? Uh, you have to make sure that you're touching everything and follow that path of uh, where the data is coming. I had Boeing come and tour uh, a facility I just opened in downtown Minneapolis, and every time I have someone from the industry, which and I probably do one every two weeks, tour, I'm just blown away that they always will catch something that no one in 20 years has ever said before. And uh, you know, there was a guy, <laughs> somehow he wanted the jams on the doors changed. You know, we have a pretty secure facility. It's a Federal Reserve Bank building. And uh, you can, uh, by gosh, I came back later and I took the door off with a screwdriver. And so I had to bury him inside the door. Um, you know, every time I have a tour, I have someone says something. Somehow, I mean, we, I try every time. I even put fake lasers up in the ceiling once because I'm like, this guy's going to go up to the ceiling and throw some powder up and he'll see <laughs> <laughs> It won't do anything, but it'll look okay. And, um, so that the point is, is they're going to get in. I think we look at it that way. They're going to get in. We now try to leave, you know, things. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, intrusion prevention systems. We've got F5 load balancing. And if you go to an F5 uh, load balancing conference, all you'll hear from them is they're trying to move farther into the space of being your firewall and being looking at the traffic and being able to help you fingerprint your sort of traffic pattern, so you'll know when you start getting uh, pat, you know, traffic that you shouldn't. Uh, there are systems that will watch uh, your sales reps, and uh, if at midnight a sales rep that's never downloaded your entire CRM database starts downloading it, you know, and there's sort of a fingerprint of that guy's behavior, and so you can kind of pick up on it. Uh, it's a crazy world out there, but there's a lot of internal and external That's threats. right. That's the uh, next point, which is, yeah, where is the threat coming from? Yeah. You can do everything to kind of build your big wall, but if somebody inside decides that, you know what, they don't want to be here anymore, then that's an issue. Yeah. And you have to track it. I actually sit on an advisory board of a company that creates uh, what we call honeypots, which is basically an attractive way for hackers thinking that they were able to get into your system, and it's more of a deception. Again, it's okay. But I will say, I mean, our firm is, is not that large, and I have uh, three compliance officers and one engineer fully engaged in denial of service attacks every day. Stopping them, not creating. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's a lot of cost. I mean, there's already a lot of cost from this. And yes, most of it's coming from Eastern Europe and, uh, and Asia, uh, period. Look at the maps. There's a great Google map now that's free that shows you, uh, I think it's probably five minute lag of all internet traffic, and, and they've got cyber threats kind of built in now, and it's amazing if you watch it because it's it's real and you've got to deal with it. I mean, it's, uh, but we look at it more like they're going to get in. Now you've got to figure out how. And I think the internal threat is actually worse 
because I think we're so all looking outward that we're not looking kind of, kind of inward. Just going to share a quick story, I think it applies to the audience here. How, how many of you woke up one day and said, I want to be in security? Probably. <laughs> maybe, maybe one. <laughs> you know, it's funny. he's got a job. <laughs> I never thought that would be insecure. I mean, if you were talking about yeah, encryption yeah. back in 95, 94, when I graduated, you know, I went for, for business. And, uh, but my first job was in banking. And uh, part of it, well, we had to protect other people's data. And then fast forward to seven years at VeriSign, what you realize is uh, it follows the money trail. So when I left VeriSign, went to first state, I now I did the river housing payments. But security now is more of a conversation than payments. Payments is just a, uh, hey, we expect that you're gonna accept my card or my PayPal account or whatever. But you start now looking at some of the new applications where payment is embedded, like Uber, the card, uh, Airbnb, any of the, the downloads. I downloaded um, just this weekend an app called Mosaic. Mosaic, for many of you that I know are taking pictures of your iPhone, you can actually create an, an album right on your iPhone. I have no idea what Mosaic is. Yeah, I get it my credit card. <laughs> I am like, oh, this is this is really nice. But <laughs> hey, it, we're certified, right? And, and hopefully, I should get my album. But you don't think about it anymore. So you really have to trust and look at uh, kind of who you're doing business with as a consumer. And uh, I, I think there's a great career in security. So before we open it up to, to the audience, I have one more question. So. We were talking about honeypots as one way of, of helping to secure your business and, and do that, compliance officers and engineers and, and really having concentration on that. Um, but really, when it comes down to your business itself and you doing business, what are, what are you doing to make sure that um, your infrastructure is secure? And how do you adapt and stay ahead of that? That's a great question. I mean, uh, you can do it on your own. That's number one. That, you know, no one person in this room can do it on your own. To, to Jim's point earlier, um, we have uh, bi-weekly meetings with our IT group, with our development group. We look at uh, companies that we've acquired. We look at what new products are being rolled out. We make sure that um, the code is being tested uh, prior to actual release, the release into production. We do have third parties coming in and kind of trying to attack us on purpose. You know, it's kind of the, the, the good guys if you will. So there is no silver bullet. You really have to be diligent and respect the, when your security and IT guys come to you and say, hey, we think we found something. This is what you have to do to address it. You listen. You shift your budget to make sure that that gets addressed. Because you know what? If it costs me $100,000 to fix it, it's much easier from uh, kind of the cost of damage especially if you don't have insurance, uh, that uh, customer attrition, we're a public company, I mean, you'll see what happened to Target's uh, stock. Again, uh, that's gonna cost me millions of dollars if I don't listen to, to my members. All good stuff. I think that, um, you know, it's different, Are you, you know, depending on what your position is. Um, but I think you've gotta get all the low hanging fruit out of the way first, right? I mean, you've got to, you know, we have a, uh, a change advisory board and a, and, a, and a security advisory board meeting every two weeks now. It used to be every month, now it's every two weeks. Uh, we talk about where all the data is all the time. You know, we've got enough because when you first start having these discussions, you'll find that it's in places you didn't think it was in, so you didn't even know what you were protecting. So I think you got to get a lot of low hanging fruit done, and you got to have it be part of the everyday experience. Um, and I agree, you've got to bring the users in. They got to change passwords. We, I'm still floored by how many places we walk into, and I guarantee if I lift the keyboard up, the password's there. <laughs> At least one person in every corporation um, that we walk into. Uh, you've got to change it all the time, and, you, and you've got to bring people into the, into the thing, and you've got to have training. The whole thing is we all have people that live lives that are trying to get to 5 o'clock and get home and have their family or drink a beer and watch the football game or wherever, and it's the last thing really on their mind. You've got to bring them into the conversation and make this about their job. And, and be part of their job and they actually get them passionate about it and, and try to make it be part of what they're doing. Because if you don't, it's like a fire drill that never gets, never gets, you know, exercise. Uh, you know, you gotta have DR days. What are you gonna do if all the, you know, if this happens? Uh, days, you, you know, where I walk in sometimes and I go, you 10 people, you get up, you leave, what are you guys gonna do? This event just happened. 
you know, people are always like, what, what? But if you do that enough, then all of a sudden everybody kind of gets that fire drill down. Uh, so not going through those things. I still think less than probably 5% of our clients and probably less uh, don't do, have a DR plan, don't do disaster recovery, don't uh, think about what they would do on those days. Don't even put the money into it. Don't even have the data somewhere else. So uh, I think it's, you've got to start behaving a lot more. And it's interesting that you raised the whole idea of employee awareness. And so one of the things at the university that we're facing is the number of uh, faculty that we have and students that we have and staff and really creating an awareness of, of about how do you use your email and really helping people to understand don't click on that thing that's asking you for your information or to verify something. And so recently, um, as we're trying to increase the awareness of our faculty and staff, um, we've had <coughs> some of our employees click on, you know, verify this information, and it's, you know, caused problems throughout our system. And right now, the university has two compromised emails, one with Con Conquest, and we have to, we at the university have to send things from our personal email to those people so we can continue that while we're working through to the struggle. So uh, how important, I think it's important, but uh, what, are, what are ways that we can, as, as people in this room, really help to raise the awareness and what can we do to educate people not to accept that phone call or call that back? Um, so what are some tips that you have? Well, I don't, I throw all emails away <laughs> and I always tell people, bug the hell out of me. You know, um, I don't want to push any products, but they're definitely, you know, we won't email uh, attachments anymore in our company. You have to email the, the SharePoint link to where it is and things like that. And a lot of companies. I think you have to start looking at those things. I think, first of all, we've blown email away and taken it way past what it should be used for. Uh, sending documents and, and that, it really isn't meant for that. Uh, there are a lot of other intranets and things like that that companies got to work on and do, to do. But I mean, um, you know, people have got to really, you've got to change your passwords. You've got to be with, uh, you've got to have somebody doing things that probably no one's ever done before. Someone's watching your, your DNS. Uh, someone's interacting with the IP addresses. Someone's interacting with the spam filtering. And someone's actually, this is a job that someone has to do. You can't just set up email and run and go and never come back and look at anything. You've got to action. So whoever's doing your IT needs to clean up their act a little bit. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> 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 pay attention to things a little bit. I got a great guy you can hire right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you got some security companies here that can probably come So I mean, I think that we take email for granted. We take the internet for granted. I, I make jokes with most of the new clients come in. I go, these are not rights in the Constitution. Email will be down sometimes. We need to pack systems every Saturday night. Things can't be up 24 again. We've got to take this stuff on and realize there's a cost, both to us and our, and our, and our liberties, and to the a cost to the companies to keep these systems up. They just can't be put up and you can't tell IT no more money, no right. more money. Uh, we won't do that. They've got to pack these systems. People got to watch them. You, people can't leave idle ID. Uh, you know, you got you to get rid of deleted accounts. Every place we walk into, again, you've got old employee accounts that are alive, and every security outside, that those are where a lot of those threats are going to come in and then manipulate, and you don't even know. Is anybody watching what's going in and out of your email system every month? You start seeing spikes, and you're, you're, you don't know where those spikes are coming from. You know, don't do email, email relay out of your mail system. There's a lot of things that, 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 that can be done, but I think that people just have to pay attention to. The other part is technology is out there, leverage technology. Yeah. We used to go, again, my days at Verisign, we were really focused on security. We talked to mid-sized large companies and say, you know, who's your security expert? Oh, we got a guy. And <laughs> yeah. that, that's what it was. We got a guy. Well, what does your guy do? And, uh, well, he was patching you know, laptops. He was patching the network. He was uh, keeping an eye on security. He was uh, uh, just doing a hundred other things, outsourced, you know, where possible, depending on the size of your company. But you got a lot of smart people out there, a lot of good companies outsource what is not for to you. So we have some time for some questions, and I'm going to save one question in the end for because I'm deep, so I can get up. Yeah. Save one question. For people, how do we make our employees aware of the fact when you download the apps, the, look at the permissions that you're giving, and the problem that is created by the permissions those apps are giving people access to our systems. 
actually with United Staff. In, in your corporate system or the personal? Well, if they're, if they're using their phones for business. And yeah, I think, I mean, I, I don't think it ever prevented. I really don't. I think you put the right uh, software that requires, for example, in our world, uh, I can download apps on my iPhone. But to get to my email, I need the password. So it's not just it's an open <coughs> system. You know, so a lot of it comes from corporate security as well. Um, you know, you'd like to think that Apple, before putting an app on their uh, store, would be scrub it with security. But the reality is, um, I think there are what 500,000 apps out there today. I'm not sure they're going through every single one anymore. Right? So you, that's right. You, you're a good partner. But that's the thing. It's yeah. like where, do, where does that information go? Yeah. You know, I don't think you're going to stop it. I think it's more kind of awareness, raising awareness, making sure that uh, it's a reputable app even. Uh, I don't know how many are still valid versus, yeah, we try pulling this app and then it didn't work, so we're just going to get out there. You know, where's, that your information? where's your information going? So. I can't add anything. I mean, you're, you're, the minute you say you can use that, you've opened the doors. And so you just have to go in with that approach. And people have to be aware of what they're doing. And people have to be aware. I mean, I, I hear about these email things. I got to tell you, I hear about these clicking on emails and stuff. I don't know what you're all doing. I mean, I don't have enough time to do most of this stuff. So, I mean, but, but I mean, if you don't really know where that's from, get rid of it. You know, if it's that important, they'll come back again. I really do mean that. If my bank really wants something, let them come at me three or four times. They're not going to stop doing business with me. <laughs> you know, um, so I don't get that. Most places, I don't know any place that I'm not, you and I aren't on the phone and you're like, okay, email me that and I'll fill that out. That that you know about. Uh, banks don't send out emails to get things from you. So just in case anybody wonders, I, they don't. Um, you know, so, you know, people gotta just wise up a little bit and stop and slow down and stop going. But, uh, you know, you're, you're open up, the minute you let out people use their systems to come in, good luck. If you wanna keep something safe, Lock it down. That, that, that's, that, I mean, otherwise you're open. Let's um, go in the back. So we have three. So we'll start with. Oh, I don't want you to ask anything. I know. You mentioned that you have a data center in China. Yep. How do you handle the data encryption <laughs> and security with a communist government that requires data keys? We use an outfit out of Shanghai, and. Um, we only host things there that are for in-country. We only host things for inside. So what we started to do, as our clients came to us with different, and Global Insurance is who we host there. Uh, we also have them in Madrid. I have Ericsson Sony in London. I have a company called uh, Rev EHR, which is a SaaS model for the health industry in Toronto, Canada. Uh, we host folks now in the locale where they are. If, if you're going to keep any information now uh, in the EU that has to do with credit cards, they want it in the EU. China wants it in China. We had so many problems hosting them here that we finally went there. Uh, so you, you, everything's internal, uh, and it's we wouldn't host anything else there. So I'm with you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't host something in China for, you know, Indonesia. Uh, it never worked. Uh, we're very opposed to the, to the regime there. Uh, so that's one client in, in, in country for in country. And uh, we don't have a problem with, they don't have a problem with that. So it, it, it works, but you're, you're, you're lock on with the fact that it's, it's nearly impossible. We have a lot of manufacturers, small manufacturers, who we've, uh, we've basically set up Chinese, Chinese uh, DNS and we've got around with a lot of things, but it mainly is just around email and FTP. They still won't let you do too much with, with anything that we're doing. A lot of the small manufacturers here, it's it, it's really slowed down actually. Um, for a while there, five years ago, everybody was running there, and now it seems to have petered off. But we usually tell them, you gotta open an office there and you gotta keep your data there, because it's just gonna be a pain in the butt. So it's still a pretty heavy problem we see there. But I will, I will use this to say, uh, a lot of people aren't liking our country very much right now. And if you, uh, we had to open up in Toronto because Canada won't let you host healthcare data in the US. So US companies can't just go up there now and, and, and use, you know, and, and, and traverse. 
you actually have to have your data and your 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 applications hosted in Canada. So no Canadian Obamacare. No Canadian. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the Patriot Act, if you actually read it and think about it from a company standpoint, is a little scary because the government can just come take anything. Yeah, I'm being nice. So let's go to Brian and then we'll go to Rita. Uh, you had mentioned earlier. Uh, CIO of Target will be testifying before Congress today. Um, I work for Target, so it's sort of interesting to us. But um, do you think, as you look at sort of the Target breach and all of the news that that generated, and I think about sometimes the things that, that govern our lives from a legislative perspective are often reactive in nature, HIPAA, the Patriot Act, things like that. Do you see a big legislative push coming in, in, the, in, this, in this space? Near future, and do you think that has the capabilities? Uh, I could take that in probably because it's also related to payments. Uh, it's actually the CFO that of Target uh, because traditionally the payments world falls under the okay. CFO organization. Um, the answer is yes. I think you're going to see push-ins. You're absolutely right. It is traditional reaction. You know, there's SB 1386 that happened in California that as a company you have to declare when you're breach. That is not a national law right now. It's starting to California because they're very uh, uh, big in that sense, and rightfully so. Uh, what you're going to start seeing is uh, what's called EMB, so chip and pin on your credit card. So today, if you think about it, you go and you swipe your card, you sign, it could be somebody else's signature, you walk away. EMB is already adopted in Canada, all across Europe, Asia Pacific, where you go in and you need a, a pin also on, on your card. Uh, so that's going to take away from some of the uh, physical store fraud, that's not going to sell probably online fraud, right? So you're going to see on the online side, it's like squeezing a balloon. You squeeze one side, it's going to pop up somewhere else. You're going to put the MV and chip and pin in the physical world, it's going to go online. So online, you're going to start uh, hearing more about tokenization, making sure that when you swipe your card or you enter your card number online, all that data is encrypted. And when it gets to uh, the data center is when, when Target's sitting or anyone else, I mean, we're putting on Target because it's uh, used now. Even when it's sitting there, it's encrypted, so if somebody hacks into it, they're gonna get 16 digits that don't mean anything in the real world. Uh, but it's gonna be pushed, it's a shame that, uh, by the way, it's not just starting. But, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a epidemic that's all over right now in all the retailers, and um, uh, they just have to be a big one. And the time of it, where it's over Thanksgiving, of course, that was raising as well. But the, the answer is, yeah, we're gonna start seeing more and more, which, you know, again, careful what you wish for, right? Uh, we used to joke at Verisign that fraud is good right? in the sense that, you know, it's, it's business for all of us, so you guys are sitting in a good spot. Uh, but uh, you really have to be diligent. Uh, I don't think it'll be the last time that we get that. My question is related to how you say everyone has to be aware and you should educate employees so they know what to do. And yet, a lot of people are just educating employees to learn how to use Twitter constructively and, you know, some very basic things. And you've got this fast-changing landscape. Uh, either we have a great uh, business opportunity for someone to do education and awareness for employees, or do you have a recommendation? And my perspective is, I have a conference on Extend Your Brand to Employees, and all these marketers and communications people don't talk about this at all as one of the things to engage employees. And I'm just curious, you know, who's doing a good job of that? Some of the stuff you say to stay abreast of, I hardly know what you're talking about, you know? <laughs> we, uh, I could speak for Digital River, actually, with a couple other companies too. Uh, we actually have a, uh, a social, social media employee handbook, and we train them. And look, I mean, you can uh, take the horse to the water, it doesn't want to drink. Nothing you can do, right? You're always going to have that rogue employee that decides to post something that's personal, and you, you just have to pull it off and delete it and educate it. And it. Again, it's not a one-time event. It really is a journey that you have to continue on educating, make sure they're they're, they're taking the online test or quizzes. Their managers are talking with them. Uh, but does that cover the, all the storage and other stuff you've been talking about here? Uh, combination. It oh, does. it does. Yeah, it's a combination of security and social media. So okay. it, uh, in my head, it's two different documents, but oh. often it leads into uh, responsibility. But there's right. no outside vendor that you know of, and it's usually an internal thing. It's usually internal. Or marketing team puts it together. Thanks. Ron, Yep. 
Uh, kind of back to Target with the breach that happened recently. What do you guys think uh, where traditional credit cards uses a, a pull transaction where you're giving up your access to your account? Uh, what do you think about using uh, alternative protocols such as like the Bitcoin protocol uh, where it's a pull transaction where you're giving them your information or a push transaction where you're giving your information to only allow them to give you funds? I mean, um, I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna have somebody's gonna come along and change the whole thing, right? One of the next Facebooks or the next the next big thing is gonna be. I don't think it'll be anything that we have right now. Somebody's got to change a lot of things, and there's a lot of pressure that will go against that because a lot of people have put money into the, the systems they have now. But something has to drastically change. This shouldn't be the hardest thing for us to, to take care of. You know, you, even just using PayPal. Eh, the way that you're talking about uh, is definitely there. Uh, part of the problem I've seen, though, is, and this is smaller than Target, you know, but every breach I've seen, no one's really that interested in talking about it. Even the credit card companies, they built it into the cost of doing business, and the, a certain percentage they'll they'll handle. We've got to get over that percentage to where this hurts for great change to happen. Because right now they just deal with it. I mean, I've seen some breaches that I'm blown away, I'm waiting. Like every day I'm like, Man, this client's gonna get in trouble. They didn't, you know, they're not in California. We don't have, you don't have to come out and publicly state that you've got a breach, which is ridiculous. Um, and we've had some clients we've walked away from because they, they won't change their code. They've had breaches and it just keeps happening. I can't, I can't stop everything. Um, so I think until we actually see the volume get worse, and it's bad, I mean, it's way worse than anybody thinks it is. I mean, how many of us have had credit cards just reissued or, or just, just change, right? It only used to be on the expiration date. <laughs> now it's like they just show up and you're like, oh, I wonder what happened to that whole batch of accounts. Somebody somebody kind of breached on it. So I think until it gets bad enough, but I think we're going to see five five guys, two girls at a little company are going to come up with something and then they're going to get bought for you know $50 billion and merged into Google or something. But someone's going to come up with a new process. Uh, I, I don't know that much about the process. You know way more about the process. So. I think a lot of it's uh, consumer behavior. I mean, we're kind of spoiled in the US. You just pull up your credit card, you put up your debit card. And if you remember for many years, we were told by the issuing banks not to use your debit card online because they had access directly to your accounts. Well, now there's, you know, you're only limited to $1,500. Uh, if I look at cross usage in Europe or Brazil, uh, it's very different. A lot of people actually put in it's more of a push. Um, they, they put in their bank accounts. It's direct debits versus a credit card. Uh, that's why PayPal became very popular because you're using your a, your email uh, technically to, to pay versus giving up uh, credit card information. Uh, you know, it'll take time. Uh, I'm not sure Bitcoin is the magic answer. <laughs> uh, but uh, again, a lot of this consumer behavior, I mean, back where it's selling apps or using whatever preferred payment method you have, uh, again, it's a 360 way of uh, protecting information. So, um, we'll have one, one more question. Oh. And, uh, okay, one, two, two, so <laughs> we'll go back here and then we'll go over here. So, I was going to make a comment more about this whole cybersecurity uh, 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 focus that you're having. Uh, this morning's blog by Brian Krebs, who wrote the, the whole thing with uh, Target. He, uh, at the end of his blog posting, talked about exactly how do we communicate this and learn more about this. We're not we're not talking about this thing. These, uh, these security breaches and the target breach in particular is very sophisticated. And they really haven't talked about it. And some of the things about encryption getting to the data center, they read they, they read that stuff well before it ever oh, yeah. got to the data center. I'm sure. So I think. I just wanted to kind of put that out there. This is a great, a great community that's starting up and a great conversation. So, thank you very much. And Krebs on security is something you should be reading right now. So, what I'm trying to understand is they've said Neiman Marcus's breach was this summer, last summer, well ahead of the target. Why isn't anyone, because they said it's coming from the same kid that sold. The target stuff sold it to others. Why is why is Neiman Marcus flying so low under the radar 
And why is nobody blasting Neiman Marcus? Because if they would have come out, you might have avoided the target breach. Because a lot of legislators probably shop at Neiman Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to actually say, they, most people probably think you, you deserve to pay a little more. Yeah. <laughs> That's why they call it Eagles. I mean, you know, I mean, Target, everybody goes to Target. Everybody shops at Target. And I think that they probably feel pretty comfortable, and they think they think that Target was pretty is pretty sophisticated. But if Neiman Marcus you know. would have come out and admitted it in August or September, the rest of the retailers might have been. We've had retail we've had breaches before. I think Target's a sexy name, a big company, uh, kind of part of the future, uh, you know, and it's 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 a good one to make an example of. Period. Okay, one more question: Is there a concerted effort? on behalf of the IT people globally, nationally, all the retailers. I know antitrust might come to place to talk about these things, to try to work as a collaborative effort. Absolutely, that is all the time. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are so many forums, so many communities out there uh, looking at best practices, looking at, uh, you know, again, I'll give you my background. Jim may have a similar background. We actually collaborated with our competitors. Uh, we, we, we now, on the credit card side, you know, we pull from different sources and share data on what uh, fraudulent cards are out there. Because look, you, you know, ultimately we're all gonna pay the price. What happens is if you get hacked and I don't get hacked, I'm gonna say, oh, it's his problem. But the reality is that cost from Visa, MasterCard, and somebody else is gonna hit all of us. So it's better to spend money now, and that, you know, we call it competition, and really it's collaboration to try and prevent can never really prevent, uh, so that our costs continue to go uh, down. It's all about money. Yeah. It's all about money. And let's face it, it's it's like many of us don't cover ourselves with something. It happens, and you just sit there going, God, yeah. <laughs> should have done that, right? <laughs> or I locked the keys in the car. It's almost like, ah, I could have stopped that. But you can't. <laughs> you can't, right? You can't rewind. And it's like buying insurance. How many people love to pay their insurance bill? They don't, you know? And unfortunately, I think too much of this is like, you know, um, inhaled in my neighborhood. I never saw any damage, but boy, oh boy, everybody got roof, new roofs. And the insurance rates went a little up. But not enough to really hurt anybody. So we all do pay for it, but until it hurts, we're not gonna change. And that is like a characteristic of this country that's as silly as anything we do is, until you poke me in the eye, I really don't pay much attention. And I'm, I'm afraid that this cost just gets spread. And for many people who want to make profit, who want their stocks to go up, I mean, are you okay with your stock going down in Target because they take a loss for a year because they're gonna invest in infrastructure? And you say, I think that's a great thing. I think I'll, I'll, I'll take that drop in my 401k this year because they're gonna go up next year. No, you bitch. Until we're ready to kind of look at this and participate, I, I think it's going to keep keep biting us in the butt. And right now, we just are burying the cost and kicking the can. It is. If you look at the cost of fraud, the last comment, you know, okay. uh, it's usually somewhere between one and two percent of revenues. Right? So you look at it and say, you know what? Uh, instead of donating fifteen percent or twenty-five percent, I'm going to donate twenty-four, twenty-three. Uh, it, it's a cost of doing business, and uh, unless it's truly visible, like Target or even Marcus, uh, there are companies getting hacked every day. Yeah. The medicine right now is worse than the illness. Until we switch that, ain't gonna change. So, we're almost to time, and I wanna keep <coughs> one more. I have, I, have, I have a question for okay. you, specifically. Just okay. you up. I know. We have, we have a concentration starting up. Yes. Does Stritch have an information security strategy for the college? Yes, we do. <laughs> so. I can tell you because I sit on that committee. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hale's so part of the trust, one of our trustees. Yeah. And so, we it just got to get email added in. Yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. Actually, we've been doing better, and where the, 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 the incidents with our email happened was in our um, affiliate faculty sure. range out from the campus. And it's just trying to keep everybody aware and, and, and up to date. But we do have an information security strategy, and we've thought through a lot of the different issues. And like most organizations, we have a, a, a very young, bright CISO. And uh, so he's 30 something, we just turned 30. So he's pretty brilliant and on top of things as we move forward. So 
that we do have a strategy, and um, we have good people like Sue Hale who are on the board of trustees and sits on that committee to help us and ask the right questions as we move forward. Because again, academic data and um, FERPA, you know, again, protecting all of your data is really important to us, and um, so we do have strategies for that as we continue to move forward. I want to keep you fairly on time um, as we close this afternoon or this evening, this morning. It's morning. <laughs> <laughs> I was dark when I came in tonight, so, I, so, <laughs> so I, I want to do just a couple quick things, and I want to have Suhail have one of the last words as we continue to move forward. But um, I, I want people to know who's in the room. So um, those of you who are current students, could you raise your hands? Which is wonderful. Um, alums. Right. And then uh, friends of the university and staff. Yeah. So um, it, it's, it's really wonderful. And then I want to recognize three individuals, four individuals actually. Um, part of our whole thing is in Minnesota is re-engaging our alums into the life of the university and the college of business, as well as to connect with our students. And so um, Eileen Manning is an alumna and an entrepreneur and owns a business called The Event Group. I had the wonderful opportunity to meet her through one of our faculty members, and within a year, we built a really great relationship and part of um, we all helping each other in creating sustainable communities is that um, she's helping to put together events like this and then also introducing. And one of the events that um, I want to make you aware of, and if you're interested in more information, talk to Eileen at the end, is every year they, they sponsor um, a cybersecurity summit with the University of Minnesota, a great opportunity. Um, I met a lot of great people through there, but it's a great um, conference and summit to be able to find out what's happening in the field. And it's really, like you said, the CISOs of people coming together to have the conversation and continue to move forward with that. So I want to thank Eileen for her continued um, help at uh, the university and introducing us. Um, I want to introduce Jim Prom in the back. One of the ways um, Jim is getting involved with the university as an alum, um, and also he's also a city council person for Plymouth. Um, and so he's doing wonderful and owns his own business as well. Um, he's going to be speaking at our graduation um, ceremony here. And so you'll see a theme here as I continue to move forward. But then I want to recognize um, two alums in this university, uh, in the university and in this room, who are also making some contributions to the university by supporting us financially. And uh, Rita Shore, who's an alumna of the university, her and her husband established a wonderful scholarship um, um, for our students around the whole area of STEM, as she has come from a background within the sciences and moving forward. But that endowed scholarship continue to help the university and our students, so thank you for your generosity. And then, as I'm turning here to look at Suhail, Suhail has joined um, four other individuals and um, put together an alumni challenge for our annual fund and um, gave a gift along with his wife to that, um, uh, that challenge, and it's really wonderful. And I have to say, what I'm really proud of is that three of the four um, individuals and, and husbands and wives who put this together this challenge grant were graduates of the College of Business and Management. And I wanna, I'm very proud that the chair of the Wisconsin Advisory Board, um, Lori Craig, um, gave a very generous gift of $25,000 to help um, seed that and put that together. So it's alumni um, like you in the room who are making a difference for us, and we are just very thankful for that. So with that, I will have Suhail um, have one last word, and then I'm just going to talk a little bit about the MBA really quickly, and then you're on your way. Suhail, um, you've had an opportunity to experience the, the university as an undergraduate student, a graduate student, and now as a trustee. If there was one key takeaway or impact that Stritch had on your life, what would that be? Do the right thing. It really is do the right thing in everything that you do, everything that you touch every day. Uh, whether it's your family, your colleagues, your business, how you conduct yourself, you know, with others. Uh, uh, look, I came, uh, I'm originally from Lebanon, got to the States in 85. I originally flew into Chicago, took the bus. We've got, more than you know, a lot in common uh, in terms of first jobs and painting and babysitting and washing towels for the basketball team and uh, played soccer, you know, all these things that you don't think about as you're growing up. but. Being surrounded by the Stritch faculty, the Stritch community, I mean, I'm serving my third term, uh, 
um, at, uh, on the uh, trustee, board of trustees. And it's not a paid position, right? It's trying to give back to a university that uh, wasn't just about me. That's where I met my wife. Uh, this year will be 24 years that we've been married. And you know, we always try to go back. We go there at 8 o'clock mass. We see Sister Camille, for those of you who haven't met her, she's 90 years old, and God bless her. She, she remember your name, uh, the name of your children, right? And uh, it's really about that sense of Franciscan values that uh, you don't wake up every morning and say, I want to embrace the Franciscan values. They just happen all the time. And that really carried with me, both with me and my wife. Uh, she's now involved in uh, St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, she's president of the chapter. And again, you don't think about it every single day, but you, when you step back and you reflect on what shaped you as a man, as a lady, uh, those are some things that shaped us. So I'm thankful for that. And, and we're very proud of our alums at the university. Our new, um, we have been in a process of re-engineering the College of Business and, and reinventing ourselves. And one of the degrees that we've spent a good deal of time studying and revamping is our MBA program. And um, after a lot of listening, and listening to what our alums were saying, and corporate leaders, and knowing what's happening in the field, we knew that we needed to create a new MBA that was taught integrated, meaning that it didn't teach you from discrete subjects, but that you look at a number of competencies that business leaders need to have, from a leadership competency, to operations, um, strategic op competencies, to then one about the financial literacies and the needs that people have to have. But what we've done is we've designed a program so that you're learning statistics and finance and accounting and marketing, as well as leadership all the way through the program. So you're seeing how it does impact a p &L and how you can make good business decisions and how everything is interconnected. And that's one of the biggest things that our advisory boards and friends tell us as a university. One of the things that we found as we looked at then taking the MBA out and looking at developing a set of concentrations is that there was really a need in the marketplace for CISOs and the people who were in the information security and the technology area to have the business acumen and to have like, basically the language and the literacy to be able to understand um, business and how things impact the, the bottom line so that they can have intelligent conversations and sell the need for security to other people in the CISO suite. But what's also interesting is the C-suite needs to understand the IT world. And so we created um, a place where Stritch can have a, a playing field, which is in business, and that's our, our emphasis, and creating then a cybersecurity um, concentration that allows people who are already have a technical background to get that MBA and then to get the advanced knowledge about information security and cybersecurity and how do you manage those risks and then how do you strategically aid from that aspect. And what's different about all of our programs uh, at the university, as you know, is that the curriculum is not just created by people like me who live in academia and um, you know, why we're full time and we know our subject matters and that. We really engage our faculty who are teaching in um, teaching um, in our classrooms, but also working in the field who write the curriculum. And so um, two individuals that I introduced early, Dave and Mike, are helping us not only to being a faculty and teaching some of the programs, but they will help it with us writing the, current, the content of those courses. And that really is this rich interchange between theory and practice. And um, so we're really excited about that. We hope to launch the program um, in late summer. And um, so you'll find out more information about that as we continue um, but it's been a great day. Thank you so much for being with us and um, for choosing Stretch and for being in the love of Stretch. And um, have a great day. I know if you have questions after, um, I know Jim and Suhail will be here for, uh, for a little bit. And um, thank you again and have a great day. Thank you.